Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And welcome to Power of the Lamb Ministries live event. We are so happy that you are here with us uh, this evening. Um, and we just look forward to starting the Sabbath off with you uh, mm -hmm. this evening. And yeah. We are dealing with a technical issue. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, that's why he got up. But yeah, we are happy. We are happy that you are here with us. Uh, pray, We're going to keep talking. Yes, and pray for tonight's service, uh, for this meeting. Like, we have been planning for this uh, all week, and so many things happen right before. Uh, the reason why we're starting late is because a lot of things happen, but we were still able to come on here. Uh, so, Satan, the enemy, is angry, but we are praising God that it's the Sabbath and we, you are here to worship with us and put in the chat if you are excited about tonight's uh, topic. Uh, yes, let us know like um, that you're, put a one, put a one in the chat if you're excited for uh, this topic tonight. And uh, we are just excited to um be and I can't really see, but I'm, 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 I'm by faith, I'm believing that there are ones because I can't see. All right, okay, yes, lots of ones. I, I believed, I had faith, I believed. Speaking of that, just because you know what we just kind of went through just to get on air tonight, I was just thinking about my shirt because you probably can't see it, like they can't see, but it's it's pray on it, pray over it, and pray through it. Um, and so. If you probably you can probably see pray pray pray, but you can't see the little fine print of what it's saying. And so I want to encourage everyone that is watching to pray pray pray. Um, just always have faith that God hears your prayers um, and that He uh, will answer your prayers. And so with that, since we're starting a little bit late, um, yes, we want to just pray and pr jump in. Yes, pray and jump in. Yes. So uh, tonight's subject, for those of you who are asking, what's tonight about? The subject is entitled The Elephant in the Room. Elephant in the Room. The Elephant in the Room. So let's pray, and uh, then we are going to jump in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that you would please speak uh, tonight, Lord. This is the beginning of a new series, an entire series entitled The Elephant in the Room. Lord, the, the prophetic significance of these messages, Lord, um, I pray that they will reach um, everyone that needs to be reached, Lord, that they will give understanding, and Lord, that uh, it will open our eyes, Lord, to see where we are and to see the enemy's, um, the enemy's attack, Lord, how he's trying to destroy uh, your church. And so, Lord, please speak, um, teach, instruct um, and um, convict, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And uh, my job, as usual, is to be learning right along with all of you, uh, but also to make sure that he keeps it as simple uh, as possible so that even a child, we always say a 10-year-old can understand, but it is our goal that everyone understands and it doesn't go over... Um, your head or my head either. So that's Amen. my job. And I'm learning right along with you. She is. She really is. Okay. Uh, she has no idea what I'm, anyway. Oh, I, I, not that I don't have any idea, but yeah. this is a new study. So we're learning together. All right. So uh, the elephant in the room, what does that mean? Uh, it's really a, uh, a saying uh, that people use when they mean that there's something obvious almost like painfully obvious. It's right there before everybody's eyes. It's huge, but nobody wants to talk about it. The elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be talking about the prophetic elephant in the room tonight. And I, and I promise you, um, there are going to be people here that, are, that may be watching in anger. Um, listen, please, I pray that you would allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. Um, yeah, please share this on your social media. Let people know. Um, and this is kind of like an in-house Bible study tonight. Uh, but please share on your social media. Let people know. Uh, we got we to gotta let this, we have to get this out. 
we got to get this out. So the elephant in the room, we're going to be talking about the second beast of Bible prophet prophecy. We're going to be talking about America in prophecy. And we're going to go to our first slide, uh, the elephant in the room. Um, are y'all seeing that backward? I mean, no, I'm seeing it just fine. Let's see. Okay. Oh, well, no, maybe so. I think they are seeing it. All right. So y'all seeing that good? Put a one in the chat if you're seeing it good. No, I think so. I think it is backwards. Y'all are good? Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So. Um, no, it's backwards. All right. That's what I was saying. I think I say all these yeses, and I'm like, yes to what? <laughs> all right. All right. That's what I thought. Uh, Let's see. Yes, please be patient with us. We, because of what we had to deal with right before we went on the air, we weren't able to. Yeah, literally right before. Seconds before. And we so we, and we weren't able to do some of these things that we normally do yeah. so that you're not seeing it backwards. Yeah. But it should be, put a one, put a two in the chat now if you're seeing it. Yeah, they're right seeing way. it. Okay, good. Yep. All right. Good stuff. Okay. okay. So um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and begin and I want to read a statement here. We're going to do a lot of reading tonight. So, Atante, can you split that up with me? Split it up with you. Okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you when to read. I'm going to read this, but I'll tell you when, okay. uh, when to read. We'll just split it. Okay. So um, from the book, The Great Controversy, and I'll give you the, the uh, reference here at the end of the, end of the uh, statement. It says here, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Mm -hmm. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the bitterest enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them. And by false reports and insinuations, Stir up the rulers against them. Great Controversy, page 608. Okay. So, um, the question is, who is the opposition that the people are going to join? When we read this statement, who is the opposition that God's people are going to join. It says that they come to see things uh, in the same way because of, uh, let, me, let me just they, quote this right. Mm -hmm. um, they join forces with by uniting the with the world, world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. Mm -hmm. They join ranks with the opposition. So here's a question. Who is the opposition? Who is the opposition here that she is warning that the pe many people in the church are going to join, are going to end up seeing things in the same light. Those who are against God. No, well, so they don't open, they don't, okay, I shouldn't say those who are against God, but those who. Who, who against, is it the world? Like, is it like, oh, you know what? They've united with uh, uh, secular people mm -hmm. um, or is the opposition something else? Are they, have they come to see things in the same way as the world, the secular world? Or have they come to see things with, I like how Felix put it, another religious power? All right? So being critical thinking, it doesn't quite say that there, but I think we're, you'll prove that. So <laughs> we're just going to look. It doesn't tell us. It just says the opposition. Right. Opposition. Right? So what is Ellen White warning in her warning, who is she warning that God's people, uh, many in the church are going to, a large class in the church, are going to end up seeing things in the same way? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at 
we're going to go ahead and look at the context of this quote. We know that it's taken from the book, The Great Controversy, but the chapter is chapter 38. It's called The Final Warning. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read just the first sentence of each paragraph until we get to that paragraph. Okay? okay. Just so that you can see what's being spoken about here. So let's go ahead. Chapter one, first sentence. The scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel, Revelation 14.8, um, is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. All right, so here we see mm -hmm. <clears throat> that the first paragraph is pointing us to Babylon. Yeah. So we know something here. We know that Babylon represents the fallen churches. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's just the per first paragraph. So let's keep moving. And um, let's go ahead and look at the next paragraph, first sentence. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought, the powers of earth, Uniting to war against the commandments of God will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, shall conform to the customs of the church by the observance of the false Sabbath. <clears throat> Let's keep reading. Um, with the issue thus clearly brought before him, whosoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. Next paragraph, the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, the line of distinction between will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the creator. Let's go to the next chapter, the next paragraph. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receives the mark of the beast, so who would those earthly powers be? What is the sign of submission to earthly powers? What does she mean here by earthly powers? Who's she talking about? She must be talking about apostate Protestantism, Catholicism, mm -hmm. that I like how Jack puts it, the pack puts it, the, the threefold, threefold union. union. That's those what can, she means, those earthly who can power. Enforce the mark of the beast. The Christian world. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's keep Before. reading. Mm -hmm. Let's keep reading. Uh, while one class, okay, just read that. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, downtrodden law, downtrodden law Satan is a stir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. So who are those who oppose it? Next sentence. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. All right. Next paragraph. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side here here it is let me let me just come come back here very quickly all right so here's a question who are we being told the people are going to the the those who are in the church are going to end up seeing things just like them who is it this, the secular world now the spiritual leader or is it the christian world the apostate mm -hmm. protestant world Put a put AP in the chat if you understand what we just went through, what, what I just shared. What we just saw is Ellen White is warning that Seventh-day Adventists are going to adopt, many of them are going to end up adopting the very same position as apostate Protestantism. They have come to see things. They have so much connected with them mm -hmm united with them that they have grown to see things in the same light, light. Mm -hmm. are y'all see 
Are y'all seeing the danger here? All right. Now I like it. Someone's saying, I, I don't agree. I don't get it. So let me just rephrase it one more time. In the chapter, Genesis, a uh, uh, great controversy, chapter 38, where she's talking about apostate Protestantism as the opposition, mm -hmm. she's saying that many Adventists are going to join the opposition and become the bitterest enemies of their former brethren. Right. So who's the opposition? Who are the people that are coming against the remnant? Is it worldly people who don't care, you know, who, who are like, we don't, we don't believe in God, we're atheists, we're secularists? No, 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 no. That's, that's not the context of the chapter. Right. The context of the chapter is very clearly that it is apostate Protestantism that many in the church are going to join with. Because, why? They have come to see things in much the same light. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to pause right there. And now I want you to understand that ultimately, this is simply saying Satan is going to try to get Adventists to join the threefold union. That's what she's telling us. Wow, yeah, okay. How is, how is Satan going to do that? And now we're going to transition just a little bit. And we're going to move into Daniel chapter 11. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but we're just, I want to show you something absolutely, absolutely amazing. Okay. So I want to talk to you right now about the king of the north entering the glorious land. In Daniel 11 verse 40, the Bible says, And at that time of the end shall the king of the south south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over all right so what is this what is this uh uh, uh verse telling us so we know <clears throat> that according to previous studies back to the basics that this daniel 11 verse 40 the king of the south is Egypt. Put Egypt in the chat for me, please, just so that we're on the same page. The king of the south is Egypt. We have demonstrated that time and time again. Go to Revelation chapter 11. You see the beast that is rising up out of the abyss mm -hmm. is called spiritually Egypt. King of the south was, the, was south of Israel in actual, you know, in literal uh, geographical terms. Mm -hmm. But the king of the south is Egypt. And I think as Adventists, we're all on the same page with that. The king of the north would be the threefold union, would be the threefold union, particularly with Satan appearing as Christ. So we've been through this study. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. But what I want you to understand is that when the Bible says that the king of the north overthrows Egypt, comes against Egypt, and enters into the countries... We need to understand that this is not so much a physical, <clears throat> it's not so much a, look, he's appearing all around the world, which he is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But how is he entering into the countries? That's the question that we have. And you guys, this is crucial to understand. Well, you're going to say something. Well, just if someone's just tuning in and you say, you know, this is talking about Egypt, but really the this, what Egypt represents. Okay. And so I think yeah. to clarify so that. So let's clarify that. So Egypt would be symbolic of everything that is anti-God, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt would be symbolic of all the principles that you might see in society today. Atheism, agnosticism, um, do, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, right. right? Just doing your own thing, right? I don't believe in God. Or maybe... Maybe you believe in God, but you're super liberal. Ah, oh, the Bible doesn't mean this. The Bible doesn't mean that. I'm not even going to say that. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep it to you don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. You're, you're anti-God. That's what it is. You are you're skeptical of the Bible. You're atheist. You're anti-God. So all the principles of... And the threefold union represents... And the threefold union, God. the king of the north, is going to represent those who are claiming to serve God, mm -hmm. but it's a false God. Right. It's a false image of God. Okay. Right. All those things. Right. This whole question of gender and sexuality, all of that king of the south. Mm -hmm. Right. 
We've done studies previously showing what actually came out of the French Revolution, right. which is what Revelation 11 is talking about, mm -hmm. and applying it to the King of the South, how it was uh, this, this rise uh, and progression of, of anti-biblical sentiments. Okay, that's King of the South. King of the North is going to represent Babylon, okay. right? So Babylon, King of the North, Egypt, King of the South. All right, very good. Now, I want to demonstrate to you, I want to show you something now here that is very important to get. When the Bible says that the King of the North is going to enter into the countries, it is actually a reference to something really, really, really important for us to understand. Mm -hmm. It's not so much talking about just his physical entrance. It's actually talking about him entering, listen carefully, entering into people's hearts. Mm. Put a one in the chat if you caught what I just said. Mm -hmm. When he enters the country, it's almost as, as if it is a triumphal entry. A triumphal entry. He's coming to deceive. In other words, he's coming to conquer. He's not coming to conquer like, man, I really want Russia. And I really want, you know, he's coming to conquer minds and hearts. And hearts. Okay. It's a triumphal entry. Mm -hmm. Let's go to our slides. Listen to this. Y'all may have never seen this before. The triumphal ride of Christ into Jerusalem was the dim foreshadowing of his coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory amid the triumph of angels and the rejoicing saints. Whoo! Did y'all see that? Did y'all did y'all catch that just now? Yeah, somebody said Jesus came on a donkey. Yes, he's coming on a donkey. But he's that come that triumphal entry we just read was a foreshadow of the second coming. So, just as Jesus triumph his triumphant entrance, <clears throat> that parallels what Satan is going to do when he enters. So, just as Jesus entered triumphantly, that's the same thing Satan's going to do. He's going to enter the countries triumphantly now. Let, let, let's read a little bit about the triumphal entry. We're just going to read the account. John 12, 12. On the next day, much people went that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, that's a donkey, sat thereon as it, as it is written, fear not. As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. Verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered they that they, they then remembered they that these things were written of him and that he had done these things unto on, and that they had done these things unto him. Mm -hmm. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for they heard that he had done this miracle. Watch this. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, what? The world is gone after him. The world is gone after him. Did you catch that, Rick? They're amazed that he's raised the dead. They're celebrating his coming. Mm. This is exactly what it means when it says the king of the north enters into the countries. It's like a triumphal entry. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, I need you to understand this. Let's go back to the screen. Why are they cheering? Why are the people cheering for Christ? Put them one in the chat. Let me see if what your answers are. Not a one in the chat. Just put your answer in the chat. Why are the people cheering for Christ at this triumphal entry? Are they cheering for Christ for the right reason or for the wrong reason? Put right in the chat if you'd like to put right or wrong if you'd like to put wrong. Why do you think, why do you think that they're cheering 
for Christ. I see y'all. <clears throat> A bunch of you are saying they're cheering for him for the wrong, wrong reasons. reasons. Well, shall we back that up? Let's do so. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> check this out, y'all. Desire of Ages, page 581. Speaking about the triumphal entry, she says, but the calm voice of Jesus hushed for a moment the clamorous throng as he again declared that he had not come to establish a temporal, a temporal rule. He wasn't Why are they kingdom. cheering for Christ? They think he's here to set up his kingdom. They think yeah. he's here to set up a kingdom. Mm -hmm. They think he's here to establish an earthly empire. Not only are they cheering because they think he's going to set up an earthly empire, but they're cheering over the defeat of their enemies. Put a one in the chat if you understand what I just said. Yeah. They are happy that he has come because now he's going to defeat the Romans. Right. Watch this. Atante, can you read that or you want me to read? It's okay. The okay. multitude were convinced that the hour of their emancipation was at hand. In imagination, they saw the Roman armies driven from Jerusalem. And Israel, once more an independent nation, all were happy and excited. The people vied, they, they vied with one another in paying him homage. They could not uh, display outward pomp and splendor, but they gave him the worship of happy hearts. All right, pause for a second. Happy hearts. Happy hearts. What's, what is the Christian world going to be like when this quote-unquote Jesus comes again? Happy hearts. Why? Why? Because they're only, they are looking forward to their enemies, the Romans, mm -hmm. being driven out. Right. All right, go ahead. Keep reading. They were unable to present him with costly gifts, but they spread their outer garments as a carpet in his path. And they also strewed the leafy branches of the olive and the palm in the way. They could lead the triumphal procession with no royal uh, standards, but they cut down the spreading palms, the, the spreading palm buffs, nature's emblem of victory and waved them aloft with loud acclamations and hosannas. Hosannas, you know what hosanna means? Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why are they cheering? <clears throat> We're not going to say everybody. Because they think he's... They're, they're celebrating him. Earthly but they are thinking enemies. that he's coming to set up an earthly kingdom. They're looking for the defeat of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the defeat of their enemies. Now, I want you to think about this. In the context of end time events, why, are, why would the Christian world cheer mm. the coming of, of this Jesus? They're looking for the defeat of who? <clears throat> the Egyptians. Right. Egypt, the king of the south. Mm -hmm. They hate the king of the south, just like the Jews hated the Romans. Are y'all catching what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. But the spirit was not one of God, you guys. God called them to win the Romans, but instead they isolated themselves and despised the Romans. It's almost like a, a sport, like they were the enemy. Yeah, y'all are the, the enemy. They're the rival. They're the rival, and no matter what happens, we will never cheer for the rival. Mm -hmm. Watch this. Another statement. Another statement, and I'll read this one. The spirit, now listen carefully to this, you guys. The spirit, which in Christ's day led the priests and the rulers to forbid the recognition, the recognition of Christ as the scent of God, is alive today and is forbidding men to accept the word of God just as it reads. Prophets and holy men of old, who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, foretold the advent of the Messiah. But when the prophecy was fulfilled and Christ came, the Jews knew him not. In their pride and bitter enmity, put those two words in the chat. Those two, 
pride, three words, pride, and then bitter enmity. Put those two things in the chat. In their pride, one, mm -hmm. and number two, bitter enmity, they unconsciously fulfill the word of prophecy. The one to whom all their hopes pointed, all their sacrifices pointed, the one in whom their hopes of... <clears throat> All right, their hopes of eternal life were centered. They forced out of their synagogues and would have thrust him over a precipice outside the gates of the city had not angels unseen by them come to his rescue. Listen to this next sentence. His disciples, not this one, the one coming. His disciples also, they turned out of their synagogues, imprisoning some and stoning others. The Christ they would receive must be one who would intensify their hatred for the Egyptians and the exaltation of the American nation. Oh, my bad, my bad, my bad. Sorry, I read that wrong. The Christ that they would receive must be one who would intensify their hatred for the Romans and exalt the Jewish nation. And he never, yeah, wow. And he never exalts one nation over another. But go ahead. We're talking about the elephant in the room, guys. Mm -hmm. I need you to understand something here. Let me, let me read another statement. When Jesus referred to the blessings given to the Gentiles, the fierce national pride of his hearers was aroused and his words were drowned mm. in a tumult of voices. Mm. <clears throat> As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world, that's the Christian world, and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. What spirit? Let me go back. Let me go back. The Christ. No, no, no. I'm sorry. The spirit which in Christ's day led the priests and rulers to forbid the recognition of Christ as a sent of God is alive today. What spirit is she talking about? Their pride and bitter enmity. What kind of pride? Pride in the Jewish nation. What kind of bitter enmity? Enmity towards the Romans. Right. Wow. You mean that same spirit, Sister White, is present in the church today? Yes. So now we got all we got to do is substitute the Romans because we're no longer dealing with the literal Romans. We are now dealing with spiritual Israel, spiritual Egypt. Spiritual Egypt is now the quote-unquote enemy of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So here's a question. How is national pride and bitter enmity against our enemies, how is that making us like Babylon? That's pretty interesting. You know how it's making us like that? It's giving us the same spirit. Mm -hmm. you're, seeing the, you're, you're beginning to see the same anger and the same vitriol and the same pride and the same uh, uh, disdain and hatred for the enemy present within the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Three years ago, if I did a presentation like this, there'd probably be like, I don't know, three times the number one right now. Well, why not now? Why not now? Yeah. American, National pride. American Bible prophecy. Yeah, yeah. Pastor, how dare you? It's all right for you to speak about Catholicism. And it's all right for you to speak about uh, 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 the beast from the abyss. And, and it's, but don't touch. America. Not yet, anyway. Don't touch it. Not yet. Don't touch it because it's beautiful now and it's precious now. But wait a minute, y'all. We're talking about the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the elephant in the room. Anytime we put nation above God, we're in trouble. 
And that's exactly what the Jews did right. in Jesus' day. And this is exactly what, me, what I'm beginning to see this spirit heavily mm -hmm. in the church. Heavily in the church. Now, someone said, am I anti-American? Nope. Mm -hmm. I, I like America. <laughs> I like living here. Mm -hmm. I am, however, anti-beast from the earth. Because, beloved, and I don't know how many times I've said this, the beast from the earth is not talking about America just in and of itself. This beast has horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. It is speaking particularly of the Christian element of America. But didn't this spirit cause the Jews to reject Christ? It, it, this is a spirit because that caused the Jews... To reject Jesus. When they saw that he wasn't coming to set up. Yeah, Jesus, aren't you a bit anti-Israel? Anti How come you're not out there talking about the Romans? Why are you talking mm -hmm. about us, Jesus? Mm -hmm. Why are you talking about us? They, I, they idolized their nationality. As right. Ellen White said, fierce national pride. Fierce national pride. It's all right to love your country. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when your love for country surpasses God. your duty to God, mm -hmm. we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. You're in trouble. Okay. So I'll fill in the blank. But can I just say Go that ahead. I think Go what ahead. happens too is that when you have that severe, supreme national pride, um, it almost like, you know, makes it seem like, okay, well, I have supreme national pride for my country and for God, almost like it's equal. That's the way that spirit comes off. That's the way it comes off. Like America is the promised land. No, y'all, the promised land it's is in heaven. heaven. God is not coming to set up a kingdom here on earth. Mm -hmm. So how in the world are Adventists going to end up seeing everything like apostate Protestantism and Catholicism? Mm -hmm. That just doesn't even sound real. Come on, man, we are Adventists. And yet she says it clear as day, a large company of Adventists, not just some, a large company are going to see things the exact way as the opposition. How is Satan pulling this off? That's the question. How is he going to be able to do this? Well, let's go back to our slides. Daniel eleven forty one. as I just said, it's a mental invasion. Happy hearts. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So he shall enter into the glorious land is, is the text telling us he's going to enter into the hearts of the remnant. That's the glorious land. It's God's church. But what, is he going to actually come and physically stand in the church? No. What he's going to do, he's going to, he's going to find a home in the hearts of many who are in the church. They're going to love. It's not just going to be a, hey, you're cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, or it's going to be Man, we are so glad you came. Now, why, why is it going to be a, we are so glad you came? Let me break it down for you. Watch this. Why will Satan be cheered on, even by Seventh-day Adventists, who have come to see things? It's like the devil is preparing, not preparing now. He is putting out delusions now to change the mindset of Adventists to become to, to get to the place where they see things so much like the opposition that when Satan comes, they're going to be like, whew. Mm -hmm. How? How, Pastor? Listen. In verse 42, it says this. He shall stretch forth his hand also for the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. What does the text mean when it says he shall stretch forth his hand and that Egypt shall not escape? Well, if you were to just do a search in the Bible of stretch forth hand, <laughs> are y'all ready for this? It takes us back to the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. Atante, can you read that? Exodus 3 verse 20. And when I will stretch out my hand. This is, this is God speaking. 
and I will stretch out my hand. Go ahead. And smite Egypt. All right, stop. Smite who? Egypt. I need to see your faces for this. Although I can't see your faces, <laughs> I just need to see your faces. See God coming. saying, back in Exodus, I'm going to stretch forth my hand and smite Egypt. Hmm. Now, do you think, remember now, Egypt represents all that we are, you know, atheism, agnosticism, the, you know, all the stuff, mm -hmm. all the stuff that so many Christians in the world right now are in such vitriol against. We can't wait for God to come and show you that we're right. We can't wait for God to come and destroy the Romans. So when the Bible says that he stretches forth his hand, interesting that that's in reference to God overthrowing Egypt. Mm -hmm. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Go ahead. With all, so, okay. With all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Uh, all my wonders, miracles, mm -hmm. miracles. Is this telling us that Satan is going to come and his miracle working power, which is going to overthrow Egypt, that many are going to be celebrating that overthrow? Mm -hmm. yes Jesus get them mm -hmm. you are here watch this <clears throat> what unites what unites apostate protestantism, protestantism right now is their hatred of Egypt now right. they don't understand that, that terminology we as Adventists understand it mm -hmm. it's their hatred of Egypt mm -hmm. so when one comes and listen to me y'all listen to me listen to me please are the characteristics of the king of it God. can be the most corrupt person on the planet if he is willing to come and fight against egypt they'll be like yep we'll take him <laughs> we'll take him wow we will take him it doesn't matter how corrupt he is it doesn't matter we'll take him if he's promising to defeat egypt we will take him adventists right in the same place we got we'll take it you have won my heart Simply because you're fighting against Egypt. Mm -hmm. Are y'all catching this? Mm -hmm. Let's keep reading. Because that's not, that's not the only one. Let's keep going. So now we're going to go to Exodus 7, 19. Can you read? And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt and upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon their pools of water that they may become blood and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in the vessels of stone. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. Ooh, ooh, cause what? Cause frogs? Do y'all remember our back to basic study? What do the frogs represent? All right, y'all got it. If y'all don't remember, go back and see. We're talking about spiritualism. spiritualism. We're talking about the miracles, the counterfeit miracles of Satan. This is, listen, we're not done. Next, next, next verse. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven that, they, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt upon man and upon beasts and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. All right, one more. I'll read this one. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So uh, what I need you to see here is something very profound, y'all. When the Bible says that he's going to stretch forth his hand mm -hmm. in Daniel 11, it's talking about 
overthrowing <clears throat> the opposition to Babylon. Mm. And watch this. All who are caught up in the spirit of wrath of apostate Protestantism, the spirit of wrath of Babylon, we don't care. You see the spiritual. It's the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. When you're caught up in that spirit of hate towards the enemies, the very enemies you're supposed to be winning, mm -hmm. the very enemies you're supposed to be trying to witness to, instead of telling them God's coming to destroy you because, you know, y'all are a bunch of wicked, evil, demonic enemies, you can begin to see how it is that that many Adventists are going to end up seeing, the, seeing things in the same light so that when Satan himself comes, the mind has already been won. The heart has already been won. And listen, if you're here to destroy the Egyptians, count me in. Count me in. You could be my Jesus. Mm, mercy. Wow. This spirit of vengeance, watch this. This spirit of vengeance, watch this. Remember the disciples, Luke 9, 52? And he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans. We might as well say the Egyptians, right? Or the people that don't like God or the people that are atheistic or the global elites. All those people, every time I mention that, you're like, pastor, you like the global elites. No, who? really? <laughs> Come on, y'all. I like everybody. <laughs> Yeah. I think everybody needs to be one. Listen to me. Let me say something here very quickly, okay? Apostate Protestantism, and I use that as a title, they have no idea what's going on. They are being misled. Mm -hmm. I am not saying in any way, shape, or form that they are intentionally ganging up with Satan like, right. all right, this is Satan spoke to us, and this is our plan. Right. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, there are genuine people in apostate Protestantism mm -hmm. who are trying to do what they think is right. And the same thing on the left. There are genuine people on the left right. who, are, who, who are so fed up with Christianity because of what they see on the right. And beloved, we have to be very, we have to be very wise. strategic and wise mm -hmm. on how we minister to both. One takes the Bible as truth. And so, you know what? We can, we can, we can go to them, go with them to the word of God and right. show them, look, this is not what prophecy states. And I know you're genuine. And, and I know you want to see this nation, blah, right. blah, blah. But look, this is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And the same thing for those on the left who don't know God. Or the, I'm not saying everybody on the left doesn't know God and everybody on the right is a Christian. But you get the idea. We ought to be, when they don't believe in the Bible, how are you going to win them when they don't even want to take the Bible at face value? Right. But what I see happening is, Pastor, you're not blasting the other side enough. Well, hold on, y'all. I'm just preaching what the Bible is preaching. I'm just preaching what Daniel is preaching. I'm just preaching what John the Revelator is preaching. I'm just preaching what Ellen White is preaching. And so many times I've said, hey, you want me to preach this and really harp on this? Give me the Ellen White text. Give me the places in Daniel and Revelation where I can preach this from Daniel and Revelation in authority. And I get nothing. Mm -hmm. All I get is, why are you always talking about prophecy? Why are you, what? what? What Adventist world is this? When did that happen? Come on, let's keep moving. So here we go. Luke 9, 52. And he sent messengers from before his face, and they went and entered into a village of Samaritan of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from a heaven? Does that sound familiar, you guys? Yeah. Revelation chapter 13, he causes fire to come down from heaven. What should we call fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. Mm -hmm. You know not what manner of spirit. That's a satanic spirit, guys. And when we see that spirit in the church, the spirit of we got to defeat our enemies and they are the wicked ones and the devil's on them and blah, blah, blah. Beloved, listen to me. It is the spirit of the enemy. It is embracing that spirit. 
which is happening within Adventism. Mm -hmm. We are now demonizing a bunch of people as knowing that they are working with the devil. They have a plot. Them and the devil had a meeting and they actually know Okay, so, you know, we, Del and I, we had our board meeting, you know, last week, the devil and all the, uh, the global elites, mm -hmm. and we decided that the best way to take over the world, you guys, that's silly stuff, man. Yeah. That's silly, silly stuff. If the world is deceived, they don't know it's Satan behind it. Right. And then we have that attitude right. that we are wrestling against flesh and blood and not spiritual right. wickedness in high places. When we begin to focus on flesh and blood, y'all, that's when we get into trouble. And that's what's being happening right now. That's what's happening right now. We have now turned our attention on flesh and blood instead of understanding that there are people out there, our brothers and sisters, both of an atheist persuasion and of an apostate pro Protestant or Catholic persuasion that are all being led astray. What are we trying to do? We're trying to be on this side. We're trying to say this is the Christian side and no matter what happens and what happens, beloved, is that the more you do that is the more you're partaking of that spirit. This is why she says, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Why? Because uniting with the world, the Christian world, and partaking of its spirit fierce national pride and bitter hatred to the stranger. Bitter hatred to anyone seeking to to the stranger. You, 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 you fill in the blank for who the stranger is. Mm -hmm. They have come to view matters in nearly the same mm -hmm. light. You know, I've heard this quote before and used not in this context at all. Like it's it's always the world. It's the world. Yeah, it's the world. And it's always like our You're becoming our, liberal. Exactly. Yeah. Our our lifestyle um issues. And so they just use it in a liberal versus conservative conservative, like in the church, spiritual, liberal, spiritual, conservative, yes. but never in this context. Never in this context. Never. But that's the context. Right. The entire chapter is talking about apostate Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're not like, oh, I'm going to be with the world and then oh, I'm going to... No, beloved. You're beginning to see things the same way apostate Christianity sees it. That's what she's talking about. Now, what is Satan's tactic? What is Satan's warfare tactic? And y'all, you need to understand this, okay? We're talking about the elephant in the room. So listen, the Bible says here, the Bible says here, there we go. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Okay, so we know that there was war in heaven. That word for war, the Greek word for war is polemos, from which we get the word polemic. Mm. What is a polemic? It is a contentious rhetoric intended to support a specific position by forthright claims and to undermine the opposing position, which sounds a lot like politics. Hmm. Politics. Okay, so hold on. Yes. Polemic. Hmm. So there was war in heaven, meaning there was a contentious rhetoric intended to support a specific position by forthright claims to, and to undermine the opposing position. Okay, so that was Satan's mode of war. Yes, put a one in the chat if y'all understand so far. Satan's mode of war was polemic. Now, the Bible says his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So that third part of the stars, they were separated from their former brethren. So, so please check this out, you guys. The way Satan brought war to heaven was by separating brethren. Mm -hmm. Put a five in the chat if you catch what I'm saying right now. Satan's method of attack. Mm -hmm. He always has to divide. Was to divide brothers mm -hmm. over polemics. Mercy. 
Put an eight in the chat if your mind is blown. <laughs> uh -oh. His goal was to use arguments to divide the church, the church of angels. Mm. Mm -hmm. watch, watch what the Bible says here. So the tail, his, his tail casts a third of the stars out of heaven. Okay, so what does that mean? According to Isaiah 9, 15, the ancient and honorable, he is the head and the prophet that teaches lies. He is the tail. The tail, beloved, is symbolic of teaching lies in this context. So what was Satan spreading in heaven? He was spreading lies. He was spreading lies. Now I want you to check this out, y'all. Listen to the quote. Atante, can you read that? Mm-hmm. The influence of mind on mind, so strong a power for good when sanctified is equally strong for evil in the hands of those opposed to God. This power Satan used in his work of instilling evil into the minds of the angels, and he made it appear that he was seeking the good of the universe. As the anointed cherub, Lucifer had been highly exalted and was greatly loved by the heavenly beings, and his influence over them was strong. Many of them listened to his suggestions and believed his words, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. All right, I'll take this. The true position of the Son of God had been the same from the beginning. Many of the angels were, however, blinded by Lucifer's deceptions. He so artfully instilled into their minds his own distrust and discontent that his agency was not discerned. Lucifer had prepared the purposes of God, had presented the purpose of God in a false light to excite dissent and dissatisfaction. While claiming for himself perfect loyalty to God, he urged that changes were necessary for the stability of the divine government. While secretly fomenting discord and rebellion, he caused it to appear as his sole purpose to promote loyalty and to preserve harmony and peace. While there was no open outbreak, watch this guys, division of feeling imperceptibly grew among the angels. Lucifer refused to listen talking about, you know, the angels trying to minister, to, trying to speak to him. Mm -hmm. And then he turned from the loyal and true angels, denouncing them as slaves. Mm -hmm. These angels, true to God, stood in amazement as they saw that Lucifer was successful in his effort to incite rebellion. He promised them a new and better government than that they had had, mm -hmm. in which all would be freedom. Great numbers signified their purpose to accept him as their leader and chief command, uh, commander. He told them that henceforth all sweet liberty that the angels had enjoyed was at an end. For had not a ruler been appointed over them to whom they, they from henceforth should no longer must yield serve our honor? He stated to them that he had called them together to assure them that he, was no, he would no longer submit to this invasion of his rights and theirs and that he would never again bow down to Christ, that he would take the honor upon himself, which should have been conferred upon him and would be commander of all who would submit to follow his voice. So here's what I want y'all to catch, guys, in that whole quote. What is Satan doing? He's instilling dissent against the government. Mm. He's talking about tyrant, tyranny. Mm -hmm. He's talking about freedom and liberty. He's causing dissension based upon arguments that sound really good. The government needs to be reformed. There's something wrong with the government. And, and he's instilling his own distrust. into he's, He has entered into their minds without them even realizing it. Are you asking how is Satan going to do that with God's church at the end of time? Beloved, in much the very same way. In much the very same way. Notice, notice what he does. Notice what Satan did in heaven. He sowed discontent and suspicion in the government. 
He sowed a desire for an imaginary freedom. Mm. Your freedom's at stake. Mm -hmm. And they were already free. And they were already free. Mm -hmm. He pointed to the fact that there needed to be a reform in the government. That there was an invasion of rights, of tyranny. So I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> Do you think that Satan will use these very same arguments at the end of time to move people to reform the American government. I'm just going to ask, what do you think? If Satan used these very arguments in heaven and it was able to separate a third of the members of the church of heaven, do you think that Satan is preparing? Remember it, beloved, his attack, his ultimate attack is on the remnant. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to find ways to bring the remnant to his side, to see things the way that he does. Mm. Are, are you catching this? Mm -hmm. Are, are y'all catching this? Somebody said he's doing it now. You said at the end of time. He's, he's doing, doing it, it now. now. Mm -hmm. It's the elephant in the room, guys. He is doing it now. So watch this. He is ultimately at war with the remnant. And watch what the Bible says. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So just like there was war in heaven, mm -hmm. Satan is now turning his war <clears throat> on the remnant at the end of time. Mm -hmm. Watch. I want you to check this out. Just follow this word, th these words with me for a moment, okay? So the Bible says that he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not work to the image of the beast should be killed. That word cause, that's a Greek word, po poeo, and it means cause. Remember that, cause. Mm -hmm. Okay? Same word that is used in John 3.25 to mean between. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. So the word can mean cause or between. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the word meta, with, it also means among. Mm -hmm. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. Mm -hmm. So remember, meta, means among, mm -hmm. and then poeo means to cause, or let's go back, to cause, or between. between. Okay. Yeah. So, and actually, my bad, that meta, well, let's just read it. And I want you to notice the words here again. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make what other word can we put in there? <clears throat> the word make is poeo. That's the Greek word. Make, poeo. What's the other word we could use? The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to cause war. To cause war. Now, what's the other word with? That's the word meta. But what does the word meta also mean? Among or between. So earlier I said uh, um, poeo meant between. I actually meant meta. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we change those words out, just listen to what the text says. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make or went to cause war between the remnant. Went to cause war among the remnant. Yes, Sean. Yes, Rodney. Yes, Jake. How can I get them into a polemic? How can I enter into the minds of, 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 of 
these Adventists <coughs> to get them to start veering off So that now within the church, there's this polemic, there's this war, there's this conflict. Just like there was in heaven, now the same thing is happening in the church. And what is it demonstrating? Satan is entering the minds of many of God's people under a disguise of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about it. Are y'all good so far? Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Let's keep moving. So, so let's talk about this false prophet, false prophets. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 13, 11, the Bible says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. So we're looking for a beast that has two horns like a lamb this is very interesting. And we're talking about the elephant in the room, right? Can I just say this? Are we talking about the elephant in the room? And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the elephant in the room, right? We're talking about the elephant in the room, which is apostate Protestantism, the spirit of apostate Protestantism making its way into the Adventist church. That's the elephant in the room. And it's so interesting because, because an elephant has two horns like a lamb. That's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Two horns like a lamb. So this beast has two horns like a lamb. Could it be possible that Satan is getting, listen to me, y'all, that Satan is bringing something into the church, into the hearts of God's people that none of us saw coming? that requires a straight testimony that maybe will cause people to rise up against it. Because I'm telling you, man, I've, I've lost a lot of friends. <laughs> I've lost a lot of friends for preaching the very same thing I've been preaching ever since I came into the church. But all of a sudden, in 2014, it became out of vogue to start to preach that. You said 2014. <laughs> Yeah, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. 2014, don't be preaching that no more, man. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Why? So, so, so come on, let, let, let's go to the screen. And, and, and we saw that, that uh, this beast represents, this second beast of Bible prophecy represents a false prophet. Are y'all with me now? Put a one in the chat. The beast... Of, of, of Revelation 13 is a false prophet. He speaks as a dragon. How does a dragon speak? The Bible says in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Watch this. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So when the devil speaks, he speaks as a what? as a liar. When a false prophet thus speaks, he speaks as a liar. Revelation 13, 11 is speaking about an entity that will speak as a liar. So this is not talking about America as a nation as a whole. It's speaking about a particular element of America, the Protestant, uh, uh, the Protestant aspect of America. That's why the Bible calls it causes beast a false prophet in Revelation chapter 19. Mm -hmm. And notice what it says here. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which, what? Keep the commandments of God, one, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. If the devil's going to attack us, if the devil's going to attack us, what are the points he's going to attack us on? What's he going to try to attack us on? Put the two things in the chat that he's going to try to attack us on. The commandments, and the, testimony. the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yeah? Now, hold on. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? 
what the Bible says, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. Ha, huh, ha. Huh. And do you remember what Ellen White said about this? She said the very last deception of Satan will be to make of non-effect the testimony of the spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. So listen, what does that mean? What does that mean? It's very simple, you guys. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And when we say the spirit of prophecy, we don't mean the writings of Ellen White. Yes, it is a spirit of prophecy, but the spirit of prophecy is much larger than that. It is the gift that God has given to the church to understand prophetic events. Right. That's the gift of prophecy he's, give, he's given us. No one else has this gift. No one else can break down Daniel. No one else can right. break down Revelation. No one else understands the three angels' messages. He's given us not only a prophet, but he's given us the gift of prophecy. So that if someone comes and says, right. hey, break it down, we can be like, all right, look, boom. Mm -hmm. So now here's a question. If the devil knows how strong we are on the commandments, hey, don't keep the commandments. Mm -hmm. We'd be like, bro, are you? Not bro, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean bro, I didn't mean, I mean bro. Uh, <laughs> are you crazy? No, come on, how are you going to convince us not to keep the commandments? However, if he can get us on the spirit of prophecy, mm -hmm. if he can just get us to exchange false prophecy right. for the spirit, if he can get us to, to, to transfer, if he can get us to start or buying just not into. not understand it properly or just not know, how, not, not understand it properly for yourself. So you're not able to share it or just to go back to what you said like the spirit of prophecy is larger than that. Many Adventists think like, oh yeah, we have the writings of Ellen White. That's the spirit of prophecy. That's they right. don't think about it as, you know, <clears throat> you are actually have insight and understand the book of Daniel Absolutely. and Revelation, which is the prophetic books of the Bible. Absolutely. So if you don't understand that, it's going to be that easy for Satan to come in. Yeah, that's right. Not even preachers are preaching prophecy. Right. If you don't understand this, it's going to be easy cake for Satan to come in and be like, yeah, boom, boom, boom. And before we know it, we are caught up in false prophecy. Revelation 13, 11, that second beast is the false prophet. What's he going to do? How is he going to try to deceive God's people? Through false prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now you say, pastor, come on. How is he going to try to deceive us through false prophecy? Y'all are going to be shocked. Y'all are going to be shocked. Listen to this. Listen to this. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Listen to this. Okay. Um, we, can't, we can't put it up? Okay. Here we go. There it goes. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. So I want you to think. Sunday sacredness deals with the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. The immortality of the soul, we're going to see, deals with the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. You'll see what I mean. The immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, and that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Spiritualism is a counterfeit of the testimony of Jesus. The latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States, not secular people, not non-believers, not atheists. Mm -hmm. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling upon the rights of conscience. Now listen, y'all. She does not say that America as a secular nation is going to trample on the rights of conscience. She says nothing about America as a secular nation trampling upon the rights of conscience. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me bring out the elephant in the room because this is an elephant in the room series. <clears throat> nothing about the government saying you must, and they didn't say that. Uh, let me just, people about to start throwing stones. Listen, a COVID vaccination, yes, I said it, 
has nothing to do with Protestant America uniting with Catholic, with Catholicism mm -hmm. and spiritualism to enforce conscience against the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. But we have gone so far off prophecy that you're hearing stuff like this from the pulpit. What? Mm -hmm. Hold on. Let's read it again for those who maybe have never read this before. Under this threefold union of Protestantism, spiritualism, and the Roman power, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Yeah, yeah, no, not Marxism, not Marxism, not communism, mm -hmm. not atheists, not atheistic. No, no, guys, no, 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 no. That's apostate Protestants' version of prophecy. Why are we mimicking their version of prophecy when it, we are clearly told from the spirit of prophecy? We are clearly told from the spirit of prophecy who the initiator of the trampling upon the rights of conscience is going to be. It's Protestantism. The very ones crying out the loudest about trampling on, on, the, on, the, on the rights of conscience, they are the very ones. And yet, listen to me, some of us are so in love with our politics that y'all not even hearing what I'm saying right now. Mm, You're just looking for the day where you could see me in public so you could stone me or tell me how much you don't, you don't like. That's all you're doing right. You're not even hearing what I'm saying. Remember that text earlier, the, the, the quote earlier, that they did not even hear Jesus' words. Mm. All they were interested in was throwing him over the cliff right. because he, he hurt their national pride. Yeah. I'm convinced some people are just not even reading. They're not even studying. They're studying from the news. They're studying from mm -hmm. their favorite Mercy. talking head. They're not reading the Bible. They're not reading the great controversy because if they were, certainly, mm -hmm. certainly, they would send me the quote, the text that mentions the global elites mm -hmm. and the communists and the Marxists. Mm -hmm. Certainly they would send those to me. Still waiting for them. Oh, well, it's not there. She doesn't talk about everything. Ah, and soon we begin to lose confidence in the writings of the spirit of prophecy because mm. she didn't mention that. You got to go elsewhere to find it. And it's not even in the Bible either. You know, I mean, I've asked for the Bible text. Well, mm. it's not there really. Listen, y'all, listen. So what is spiritualism? What is spiritualism? So remember the first, we talk about the first lie, the first lie, spiritualism, Genesis 3, 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And we talk about the state of the dead, right? But beloved, do you also realize that this false testimony, that it, this communication with a demon was also spiritualism? Did you catch that? The first lie, the communication with a demon was also spiritualism. So can we say, listen carefully to me now, can we say, that communicating with demonic spirits is also spiritualism. Yes mm -hmm. or no? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. Listen to this. The lying spirit that enticed Eve in Eden finds acceptance with the majority of Earth's inhabitants today. Even the Christian world refuses to be converted by the spirit of God. But, but listen to the prince of darkness as he comes to them in the garb of an angel of light, a lying spiritual. That is spiritualism. spiritualism. Not just the dead, but lying spirits with demons. Mm. So watch this. Spiritualism is a false spirit of prophecy. Put a one in the chat if you understand what I just said. Spiritualism is a false spirit of prophecy inspired by Satan. True prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. False prophecy, when people go into trances and, oh, you know, the spirit of God communicated with me. That's spiritualism. It's a false spirit of prophecy. Let's read again. Satan went forth as a deceiver to put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. See that? A lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. He accomplished that which was his purpose. Taking advantage of the disappointment of 1844, 
He shook the faith of believers in Christ's coming. He threw them off track, blinding their understanding in regard to the sanctuary question, which if properly understood, would have established their faith in the prophecies. From the time of his expulsion in heaven, Satan directed his efforts against the law of God. He heaped upon it rubbish of tradition and prejudice. But in 1844, God directed the eyes of his people to the sanctuary and the first angel's message was proclaimed. Satan saw that this work must not go forward unhindered or the world would soon be warned. He said, this must not be. If we cannot do something to hinder the advancement of this work, the knowledge of the binding claims of God's law will go speedily to the world. A vast army will be raised up for the Lord to enter the dark places of the earth. <clears throat> Our rule will come to an end. The sins of those who accept Christ will be laid upon us. Watch this. Watch this. Before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness that has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. All right. All right. Let me, let me read this next one, and, I'm, and then I'm going to comment. I warn our people that the right among us, that right among us, some will turn away from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and by them the truth will be evil, evil spoken of. A marvelous work shall take place. Ministers, lawyers, doctors who have permitted these falsehoods to overmaster their spirit of discernment will be themselves deceivers, United with the deceived, a spiritual drunkenness will take possession of them. All of that, beloved, I just read. I got to read this too. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Now, let me comment. Ellen White is warning us here against false prophets. She's warning us here that at the end of time, before the revival that is to come among God's people, there's going to be a, a, a counterfeit revival. And this revival is going to be all surrounding false prophets or false prophecy. That's Revelation 13, 11, you guys. False prophets will come on, <coughs> will come on the scene. Mm -hmm. False prophets speak smooth things, prophesy lies, and cry peace. Peace and safety, which has ever been pleasing to unconsecrated professors, hence the love of peace and safety in the delusion of spiritualism. And so now she's warning about spiritualism being connected with false prophecy, with false prophecy. Okay. Again, I've heard these quotes before, but they're always in the context of um, just the not like the false prophet, not. I mean, not from being outside, but from being within the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is talk. This is prophecy coming from outside. Mm -hmm. And I want you to watch this. Listen. And someone asked if there's no parallel between the COVID pandemic and. So let me say this. When. If all are required to get insurance, it's going to be very similar to that when the mark of the beast hits. Mm -hmm. All are going to be required to get the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful not to think that just because something goes universal, everybody has to, has to have a license. Everybody has, like when right. social security cards came out, there were probably people like, here we go. That's it. This is, come on, y'all. And, and y'all stupid Adventists went ahead and got the social security. We know what you're going to do right. when the mark of the beast right. hits. You're going to get the mark of the beast. Why? Because you got social security. <laughs> and right. social security is a clear forerunner of the mark of the beast. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, not trying to make fun of that. I'm just saying just because something is a global command does not make it like this is leading up to the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. Just because something is, it happens, I should say, on a national level, everybody has to get a driver's license if you're going to drive. Everybody has to, you know, taxes. pay taxes or you could go to jail. Or you could go to jail. These things, we're not going to say, see, the taxes are a for a, a 
you know. And I, I don't know what else to say. But I will show you, though, I will show you, though, why many of you are saying right now, listen to me, I will show you where that argument of COVID being a setup for the mark of the beast came from, if y'all are interested. And this is why we're talking about the elephant in the room, because listen to me, y'all, many of us do not realize that the very things we are saying, by the very things we are saying, we have bought into. When the, when the, I forget what pandemic it was that hit in 18, in the 1800s, 1880s, not the no, Spanish, not in the Spanish. 1880s. Oh. And people then were like, if you get this pet, this, this, uh, this vaccine, you're preparing for the mark of the beast. Newspaper articles in the 1800s talking about this. And Ellen White was like, hey, um, you know what? If the vaccine, uh, you guys. I did a whole presentation on this. Yeah. I did a whole presentation on this. So what I'm saying is, please remember, remember what I'm trying to tell you. The very arguments, you know where this stuff is coming from? Everything that so many of us are seeing right now in Adventism, we've gotten, let me say plainly, the elephant in the room. We've gotten it from apostate Protestantism. We've gotten it from various, from certain news stations. We've gotten it from certain talking points that we, that we favor. Mm -hmm. That have no prophetical. That have no prophetic understanding, understanding right. of anything. Mm -hmm. But we take it and we try to say, okay, this must mix with prophecy. And this must mix with prophecy. And you're a part, beloved, if we make everything a part of prophecy, prophecy loses its meaning. And its power. And its power. Mm -hmm. We don't have to veer off and add this and add that. All we need to do is stay right there in Daniel and Revelation, stay right there with what Ellen White told us was coming and stick with that. We do not need to invent or, or add into the prophecies. Mm -hmm. It's good enough as it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's keep moving. Oh, we're going to, I just got to get to a certain point, a certain place. Just, just follow me, please. Okay. All right, listen. Where's that certain point? That certain point <laughs> is coming soon. Okay. It's coming soon. Uh, my soul is made very sad to see how quickly some who have had light and truth will accept the deceptions of Satan and be charmed with a spirit's holiness. When men turn away from the landmarks, the Lord has established that we may understand our position as marked out in prophecy. They are going where they know not whither. Listen, beloved, we got landmarks. All you got to do is go to the great controversy. That's it. I challenge people all the time when they come at me with this. What about communism? What about Marxism? What about the global elite? What about, what about the, the, uh, the vaccine? I, all I say is take me to the great controversy. Take me to the Bible. Take me to Daniel. Take me to Revelation. And please show me what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I've been asking this for three years. Three years years and all i get is a roll of the a roll of the eyes come on come on you can't see no if it's not in prophecy i can't see it if it's not in daniel and revelation no i can't see it if it's not in the great controversy no i can't see it i don't want to see stuff that i can't prove from daniel or revelation or the great controversy i'm just not interested mm -hmm. I'm not interested. So, so like, watch this. It's like Satan has us chasing rabbits. He has us chasing rabbits. Mm -hmm. False prophets through whom the spirit of Antichrist works will seek to seduce believers from the truth by spiritualistic suppositions and fables clothed in the, in the garments of, of truth. They will present ideas that will captivate the minds of those who are not established in present truth. We need to watch unto prayer, walk and working in constant dependence upon God. He in whose Christ, whose heart Christ is formed, he to whom Christ is the hope of glory, enlightening, sanctifying, strengthening, will be preserved from the false representations that will be made of God. Are you understanding this? She's clearly telling us that false prophecy is going to take a lot of people out. Hmm. Listen to what else she says. 
Satan gives his power to those who are aiding him in his deceptions. Therefore, those who claim to have the great power of God can only be discerned by the great detector, the law of Jehovah. The Lord tells us if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The sheep's clothing seems so real, so genuine that the wolf can only be discerned as we go to God's moral standard and there find that they are transgressors of the law of Jehovah. So let me break this down for you. Let me break this down for you. <clears throat> Does, do, do Adventists have a polemic? Put a one in the chat. Do Adventists have a polemic? Remember, Satan causes war. The war is a, a, a polemic war, which means Adventists have a polemic. Okay. Well, what is the polemic of Adventists? The polemic of Adventists, if you go through the book of Daniel, Daniel 2, it's the papacy. Daniel 7, it's the papacy. Daniel 8, it's the papacy. Daniel 11, it's the papacy. Daniel 12, it's the papacy. Okay, we just went through the whole book of Daniel. What about our polemic in the book of Revelation? In, Re in the seven churches, the focus is on the papacy. In the seven seals, the focus is on the papacy. In the seven trumpets, the focus is on the papacy. In, in Revelation chapter 11, the focus is on the king of the south, Egypt. Okay, one for Egypt, 10 chapters on the papacy. Mm. Now we get to Revelation chapter 12, apostate Protestantism. Chapter 13, apostate Protestantism. Chapter 14, apostate Protestantism. Chapter 15, apostate Protestantism. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, all of it. So here's my question. 90% of our polemic, and by the way, let's do the great controversy. Out of the 40 chapters in great controversy, one chapter is given to the French Revolution. Everything else mm. is the papacy followed by apostate Protestantism. Mm. Mercy. So our polemic, meaning our argument, the same word used for war, our war... Our war is to preach the three angels' messages. Mm -hmm. Our war is to take the three angels' messages and go to people who are in apostate Protestantism and tell them, listen, we know that you, that, that, that you're, you really want truth, but what you're, what you're preaching and, and your plan and your plot, it is not from God. Mm -hmm. We're to go to the people who are atheists and agnostics and be like, listen, I get that you see all the wrong things going on with Christianity. And I'm going to tell you, you are right because that's not true Christianity. Wait a minute. What do you mean I'm right? The Bible agrees with you. What? The Bible agrees with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. The Bible actually tells us that apostate Christianity is going to be doing this at the end of time. What? The Bible says that? Show me where. And guess what? Now you're winning people. Huh. Huh. Now you're doing what God called you to do. Mm -hmm. Not side with one over the other. I hope y'all are catching this. I hope y'all are catching this. So, so, so now, so why did, I, why did I just share all this? So we got the Adventist polemic. What about the devil's polemic? 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Okay. All right. All right. We had to do that off camera so you wouldn't see the <laughs> eye <face>. contact between. <laughs> My face. You wouldn't see her face. And All right. Only Ten because minutes. we have plenty of time, as I know everyone's enjoying it, and, this, and it's gotten very good, but we're, there's no one stopping us for how, how many times we, yes. can, we can do this series. But okay, All right. 10 more minutes. All right, so watch this. Um, I don't know if uh, there's anyone of, on any one of our team that may be able to jump into this chat, because uh, we, if, if people are, if there's some, I think there's some random stuff being posted here. Okay. Um, but uh, okay, let me see. I think I got that. <laughs> Let's. Okay, so what about Satan's polemic? What about his? What is what is he trying to introduce into God's remnant? So I want to talk to you about three waves. Put that in the chat for me, please, everyone. Three waves. All right. In Revelation thirteen eleven, we're told that this false prophet which represents false prophecy, is going to do great wonders, make fire come down on the earth in the sight of men, okay? So let me just, let me just move here as quickly as I can because I need you to see this, okay? So um, 
I'm going to skip this to unclean spirits going forth to gather the world. Uh, in 1849, now y'all need to follow me on this. This is fire, you guys. This is fire. In 1849, this is what Ellen White wrote. I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York was the power of Satan clothed in a religious garb to lull the deceived to more security and to draw the minds of God's people, if possible, to look at that and cause them to doubt the teaching of God among his people. I saw that Satan was working through agents in a number of ways. He was at work through ministers who had rejected God's truth and had been given over to strong delusion to believe a lie, that they might be damned. While they are preaching or praying, someone would fall prostrate and helpless, and uh, not by the power of the Holy Ghost, no, no, but by the power of Satan, breathed on these agents and threw them to the people. All right, keep following. I saw that as God worked in power for his people, Satan would also work. And that the mysterious knocking and signs and wonders of Satan and false reformations would increase and spread. The reformations that were shown me were not reformations from error to truth. No, no. But from bad to work, worse. For those who professed a change of heart had only wrapped about them a religious garb which covered up the iniquity of a vile heart. Some appeared to have been really converted so as to deceive God's people. But if the heart could be seen, they would appear to be as black as ever. My company angel bade me to look further for the travail of soul of sinners as, as used to be. I looked but could not see it for the time of their salvation is past. Ellen White talked about this knocking. Hmm. Y'all know about this? The Hydesville or uh, Rochester knockings? She says she saw this would, be, this would be the beginning of spiritualism. Well, that was in 1849. Hmm. If you fast forward half a century, we get to, are y'all ready? Trying to do this as quick as I can because I'm actually almost done here. So, <laughs> Why are you telling the truth? <laughs> watch. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the first wave of revival? Let me, let me read it to you. <clears throat> I'm not familiar with the knocking. The Azusa Street Revival. Okay, I'm familiar with that. Y'all have heard me talk about this before. I'm familiar with that. <clears throat> the revival began on April 9th, 1906, and continued roughly until roughly 1915. On the night of April 9th, 1906, Seymour uh, and seven men were waiting on God on Bonnie Bray Street when suddenly a, as though, uh, and when suddenly, as though hit by a bolt of lightning, they were knocked from their chairs to the, to the floor. And the other seven men began to speak in tongues and other and the other seven men began to speak in tongues and mm -hmm. shout out pray, loudly praising God. Right. The news quickly spread. The city was stirred. Crowds gathered. Services were moved outside to accommodate the crowds who came from all around. People fell down as they approached and attributed to God. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the sick were said to be healed. Most of today's Pentecostal denominations point to the Azusa Street Revival as the catalyst of the worldwide, wild, worldwide growth of the charismatic movement as they believe the Holy Spirit was once again poured out in a new Pentecost. Okay, so can we understand here that this Azusa Street revival was the beginning of mass spiritualism in the church? The, high, the, the, the knocking that Ellen White talked about was purely, athe I would say, a denial of God type of atheism. But the Azusa Street Revival, the first wave, is, is it called, it's called now because two waves came after that. Mm. The Azusa Street Revival was the birth, as it were, of the Pentecostal speaking in tongues, and, and, and that is the sign. And it was held to the Pentecostal church. Okay, so that was the first wave. But there came a second wave. The second wave then came in the 1960s with the charismatic movement, in the charismatic movement, Pentecostal doctrines, teachings, and practices began to spread to non-Pentecostal churches and denominations. This wave brought increasingly popular, uh, brought increased popularity to the word of faith and name it and claim it teachings that are still popular today. In contrast to Pentecost, to Pentecostals, charismatics tend to accept a range of supernatural experiences such as prophecy. What did I just say, everyone? Prophecy. prophecy, miracles, 
healing, or physical manifestations of an altered state of consciousness as an evidence of having been baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, wave one. Wave one. As I am blocking uh, crazy uh, comments here. <laughs> wave one. Azusa Street Revival, 1906. Strictly Pentecostal and strictly speaking in tongues. Wave two, it has now spread out, not just the Pentecost, but other denominations, Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, etc. <clears throat> and the, this revival includes now not just speaking in tongues, but the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, please, I want you to understand here. The prophecies... In these days, so we're talking about now <coughs> uh, the 60s, they were personal prophecies, right? Wasn't anything about God prophesying about mm -hmm. like a nation, right? right. You're going to see in this third wave. Let me just get to it. Here's the third wave. The third wave is called Neo the Neo-Charismatic Movement. The third wave movement is a Pentecostal or Charismatic Movement that began in the 1980s. It is sometimes called the third wave of the Holy Spirit or the signs and wonders movement. The name third wave was coined by C. Peter Wagner, remember that name, a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He referred to the movement as a third wave because this was the third of three distinct Pentecostal charismatic movements in modern Christianity. In the 1980s, another movement of the Holy Spirit, supposedly characterized by signs and wonders, began in the Vineyard Church. And it goes on to say that this movement basically uh, included things like the Kansas City Prophets and the Toronto Blessings or the Toronto Laughing in the Spirit. Have y'all heard about that? The Laughing in the Spirit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was part of this third wave. Now, here's what's interesting, interesting about this third wave. In this third wave, not only did it go beyond denominations, but now the element of prophecy was really focused upon. Mm -hmm. In other words, God was now going to bring prophets on the scene in a mass scale. Put a one in the chat if y'all catch where I'm going with this. Remember, who is God trying to deceive at the end of time? He's trying to destroy the remnant. What is he going to use? He's going to use a counterfeit spirit of prophecy. Interesting how in the 80s and 90s, there begins to be this rise of prophets. This leads me, and we're going to close on this point. I got a video to show you, and then we're going to close, okay? But let's just, let's just go here very quickly. Okay. <clears throat> In this third wave arose something called the apostolic prophetic movement, and forgive the, the error in the spelling of prophetic there. This apostolic prophetic movement, basically, I'm not even going to read this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kansas City Prophets. I'm going to skip this. Here's where I want to end. I want to, want to stop real quick. So. <laughs> I didn't know we were on. <laughs> That's she's okay. telling me I got to like, end now it. end. Because he just said stop. Okay. Like, end. Okay. Just because this is a, <laughs> this is a lot to take in. And it we is. have, we're going to, this is supposed I'll to be get like. I'll you my a, slides. And it's supposed to be a five-part series as well. And it's probably going to be longer than five parts. And probably going to be longer. So, But I need to show you this video, he and then we're going to wrap it up. Okay. I'm going to summarize this, okay? I'm going to summarize this. That's quite funny. <laughs> the apostolic prophetic movement, they moved away from the second wave in this sense. They were like, look, we don't want churches. We just want to inspire people and teach them how to be prophets. Right. Teach them how to be prophets. Mm. We're going to teach how to get, how to become a prophet. Listen to me, y'all. If you go on YouTube right now or TikTok or Instagram and type in prophetic word, you will see hundreds of prophets, hundreds of prophets that now have a word from the Lord. Mm -hmm. These prophets are part of what is called the fivefold ministry. And let me read it on the screen here because this is what I want to, this is what we're going to end on, okay? 
<laughs> this fivefold ministry. They're all mad at me. Yeah, this fivefold <laughs> ministry. No, no, no. We're good. We're good. This fivefold ministry restored and applied to the religious mountain, whereby fivefold ministers were seen to emerge to equip and raise up saints. However, it is now being restored and becoming more prevalent across the various spectrums of society, as well as under the seven mountains mandate. What in the world, Pastor, is the seven mountains mandate? See me skipping these slides. The seven mountains mandate came into being in 1975 when God allegedly delivered a concurrent dream to, mission, to missionary movement leader Lauren Cunningham and Campus Crusade for Christ founder Bill Bright and televangelist Francis Schaeffer to invade the seven spheres. Dominionism, yes. The largely dormant idea was resurrected in 2000 when Cunningham met with strategist, future, and compelling communicator Lance Walnu and told him about the vision of 25 years earlier. The prophetic Walnu, a 63-year-old business consultant based in Dallas with a doctorate in ministry with a specialization in marketplace from Phoenix University of Theology, immediately saw the idea's potential and began promoting seminars and training courses on the theory as a template for warfare for the new century. Its real surge in popularity, popularity began in 2013 when Wanu co-authored the movement Call to Arms, Invade Babylon, the Seven Mountain Mandate with Pastor Bill Johnson from the prominent California mega church, Bethel Church. The Seven Mountain Mandate or Seven Mountain Prophecy is a strategy for evangelizing the modern world and enlarging Christ's kingdom. It has especially gained a following in charismatic and Pentecostal churches. Those who follow the Seven Mountain Mandate believe that the best way for the church to be effective is to bring change in the seven major spheres of influence in society. In other words, y'all, this prophetic movement is planting discontent and suspicion in the government, desire for an imaginary freedom, mm. a need to reform the government, and a warning against the invasion of rights and tyranny. Mm. It is fostering a national pride and open anger and bitterness towards perceived enemies, meaning Rome and Egypt. Y'all get the point? Here are the seven mountains. Education, religion, family, business, government, arts and entertainment, and media. And here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to my last slide here. Wow. These new prophets are, are prophets in high places. In other words, they are connecting with people who are of a political, a particular political persuasion. I need y'all to catch this. Their ideal, their goal is to take over these seven mountains. So for example, they, 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 these prophets speak things like this. The media is corrupt. Y'all not feeling me. The media is corrupt and therefore needs to be one for Christ. Have you heard? Have you heard people repeating this prophecy that these prophets are getting from some kind of spirit that says, yes, the media is corrupt. And unless Christians take over the media, so I'm getting off of Facebook and I'm getting on to Rumble. I'm getting off of Facebook and I'm getting on to this platform and that platform because they are censoring. Beloved, all of that talk is coming from the prophets Listen to me from the prophets of this third wave of, Pen of Pentecostalism. Hmm. Government is another mountain. If you have watch this, the devil wants us to buy into the seven mountain movement. And th these people are talking about raising up an army. Do you know that Adventists are being drafted into this army without even realizing it? They are repeating the talking points of the seven mountain mandate are the in media and, 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 and the government. We need to get our people to the top of the government and, and, and family and educate. All these things, y'all, listen to me. I'm skipping. I'm really skipping to be here. We're going to come back to this next week. But here's the thing. In Ellen White's day, 
there was a movement called the National Reform Movement. I think that's what the name of it. It was a political movement. And she pointed it out saying it was made up of Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. And they best pictured what apostate Protestantism is doing. She was not afraid. We're about to close this down. She was not afraid to call out a political party. She was not accused of being political. She was being prophetical. I got the quotes, y'all, but y'all gonna have to wait till next week. I'm sorry. You're, you're like, I've never seen that quote before. Why? Because it's a footnote from the great controversy. In the great controversy, she says, in the movements now afoot, the principles of Roman Catholicism are now grabbing, you know, something like, you know, taking hold of the government. And then there's a, there is a, a, a footnote right by that statement. Go to the footnote and see. She calls out this political party has joined hands. And here's what she says in it. She actually says that they excuse the joining of Catholicism and Protestantism because of their hatred of secular atheism. I see. Y'all didn't catch that. I know y'all didn't catch that. <laughs> I know y'all didn't catch that. Their excuse for, gra for Protestants and Catholics coming together was as long as y'all hate secular atheism, we're good with joining hands. Mm. Not only can I not read that to you now because my, my, my iPad is about to die, which I don't know why so it's about to die. my fault. <laughs> You'll get it next week because we're going to do a little recap next week before we move forward. But I just need you to understand here. I just need you to understand. Let me go. Let me go. I'm skipping a bunch of stuff here. I want to show you. I want to show you just one video. Was this next week's presentation? No. All that was for tonight? All this was for tonight. Love him. Is there a political party right now? Is there a political party right now? Listen to me, y'all. Is there a political party right now that embodies everything, Protestantism, Catholicism, and their mission to take over the world? Listen, y'all, it's the elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the room. Yes. An elephant has two horns, y'all. An elephant has two horns. And you know what? You know what's amazing about this? Where is the Adventist voice calling out, crying out? Where is the Adventist voice? How come we're not hearing this preached anywhere? Now, you know where I'm hearing it from? I'm hearing it from donkeys. <laughs> y'all didn't catch that. I can go on YouTube right now. And all I see are a bunch of donkeys. Y'all are not hearing me. A bunch of donkeys saying, listen, there's something going on with that elephant in the room. <clears throat> Y'all are wisely talking about the donkey. I'm, I'm going to talk about the donkeys right now because, listen, the donkeys have no clue that what they're saying is actually in the Bible. Mm, they don't even know what they're saying. But we understand where's our voice. Why are the donkeys speaking? Why, why, why isn't the church speaking? How is it that we have silenced our voice? Could it be because we love the elephant in the room? How did the elephant get in the room? Why is the elephant in the room? The lamb should be in the room, not the elephant. But here we are, because of the elephant, some people won't even listen to me anymore. You, you have desecrated my beloved elephant, my idol elephant. Listen, let me tell you something. And for those of y'all that haven't seen my Back to Basics series, listen to me again. Atheists, y'all say, oh, it's both sides. Listen to me. The king of the north defeats the king of the south. Right. And that is a fact, y'all. The king of the south is not going to be like, hey, king of the north, let's get together and work together. I'll right. be atheist. No, right. the That's king of the bad. south becomes converted. There's no way they that become, atheists or bad. Democrats or anybody's going to join the religious right. No way unless a miracle happens. 
So we need to get out of this mindset of, yeah, cop, cop 23, cop 20, and now it's cop 20. I'm, I don't know what the next cop is coming up. And people, yeah, that's good. Something's going to happen. Listen to me, guys. We are making fools of ourselves every time we do one of these. COP26, the Pope is now here. We are Pope watchers. Mm, mercy. And as much as we love watching the Pope, guess what we won't do? We're not going to speak about that beast from the earth because that's Americanism. Yeah. Watch. Here's a slide. Video. Video. <laughs> Looks like there's no audio. Okay. <clears throat> We're hearing it, but you can't hear it. Yeah. Let me... Uh, or it's poor sound or they can't hear. Let me do this real quick. Power on. Bluetooth connected. Okay, we're going to get the sound louder for you. This is just it. We'll keep this whole secret between you, me, and them, and everybody. Whoa. The people that are actually at the tip of the spear, working directly with President Trump on a day-to-day -day basis to save this nation, they're all joining us on the Real Way to America tour. Yeah, President Donald J. Trump's chief of staff, Cash Patel. We've got Peter Navarro has joined us on the tour. We have General Michael. We have Eric Trump. The people actually working at the tip of the spear with President Donald J. Trump to save America are joining us on the Reawaken America tour. Whoa. If word of this gets out, if the truth about election fraud, medical fraud, religious fraud, monetary fraud, and mainstream media gets out, it may just save the nation. And now we're taking the Reawaken America tour to Mannheim, Pennsylvania on October 21st and 22nd. Again, we're taking the Reawaken America tour to Mannheim, Pennsylvania on October 21st and 22nd. And then on November 4th and 5th, we're taking the Reawaken America tour to Branson, Missouri for the final Reawaken America stop of 2022. Come join Simone Gold, Mike Lindell, General Flynn, Pastor Greg Locke, Stella Emanuel, Eric Trump, Dr. David Martin, Cash Patel, Owen Troyer, and many other great American patriots. On the Reawaken America Tour thus far, we featured Charlie Kirk, Sean Foyt, NBA great Jonathan Isaac, Chad Prather, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Seth Holhouse, Alan Keyes, Melissa Tate, Dr. Judy Mikevitz, Alex Jones, Owen Troyer, Dr. Richard Bartlett, Roger Stone, Pastor Mark Burns, Mike Adams, Sidney Powell, Scott McKay, Joey Gilbert, the prophet Amanda Grace, the prophet Julie Green, Del Bintry, King America, and countless names that you know. Come join us on the Real Life America Tour. Get those tickets at timetofreeamerica.com. Typically when they go to timetofreeamerica.com. All right. Um, did y'all hear the mention of two prophets at the very end of this? Did y'all hear the mention of two prophets? These two prophets are part of the apostolic prophet movement. I don't know if y'all were listening, and I wanted y'all to listen. At the very end, he mentioned two prophets. Now, I need y'all to understand this. These are the same prophets. These two prophets, we'll go into this next week. They are seven mountain um, mandate prophets. Mm -hmm. And what I want y'all to see here is that What's happening to the elephant in the room is that it is, a, it is an intentional merging of prophecy, the seven mountain mandate, and political power, which is exactly what Revelation chapter 13 is telling us is going to happen. Now, I get it. Some of you are like, this is going to cause more division. I get that. Just like probably Jesus addressing Satan's rebellion in heaven, probably made the angels even more mad. I get that. But listen to me, y'all. 
The straight testimony is going to cause a shaking and people are going to rise up against it. Your love, I'm not talking about anybody here, but I'm telling you this, many of us, our love for politics is what is causing the division. Because what y'all heard from me is nothing but truth tonight. I gave you Bible, I gave you spirit of prophecy, but it is those who in their mind have been caught up in this spirit of apostate Protestantism, this spirit of Babylon, this spirit of we got to take these mountains. You have been recruited for the seven mountain mandate and don't even realize it. You're listen, look, look, just in case y'all think I'm making it up. My last slide, I promise you. Here is Mike Flynn on the Awaken, the Great Awakening Tour, Reawaken America Tour. And look what he has in there. Look at the flyer. You got the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset. Hmm. The Great Reset, that's something prophetic? Because I didn't see nothing about a Great Reset in the Bible or in the spirit of prophecy. I didn't see anything about a Great Reset. But how come so many Adventists are talking about the Great Reset? Where did that come from in the Bible? Where did that come from in the spirit of prophecy? Watch what. So the one book is the Bible, and on the other side, COVID-19. <laughs> COVID, that's the blue book, COVID-19 and the Great Reset. Now, hold on, y'all. Come on. Come on. How is it? that these talking points have made their way into the Adventist church. Mm. We have a message. They, they don't know the message. Right, they don't. they don't. Their whole idea of prophecy is that communists are coming to take over America. The liberal left is coming to destroy America. They're going to they're going to institute a uh, uh, you know the, yeah. this 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 camp and Christians are going to be killed and raptured. How in the world did we get to the place where we have allowed the elephant into the Adventist room. We're supposed to be preaching the three angels' messages, but here we are fighting on the seven mountains. Yeah, we should be sharing the three angels' message with them and helping them understand true understanding of prophecy. A but true we've, we've, understanding of prophecy. But we've joined. On How a, we've joined it, on a certain level. We have joined their military. Mainly, I feel because um, I've said this before, I said this in the Matthew 24 study and the Back to the Basics series that, you know, I feel like many Adventists only have talking points, understanding of prophecy. They don't have an in-depth, connect the dots, understanding of prophecy. So when they start hearing <clears throat> these other things, they start filling in those gaps of, of knowledge and with this other false stuff. And it just... Listen... Then they just go with that. Yeah. You may as well ask me, why don't you talk about Buddhists? They're bad too. You guys, listen to me. What, what is this be fair stuff? Be fair and talk about Buddhists too? And be fair and talk about Muslims, the Muslim takeover of America? Come on, you guys. That's not prophetic. Stick with the, stick with the three angels' messages. Stick with the prophecy. I feel like the true understanding of prophecy is so it's it's enough and it, it's more than enough. Um, and no other church has the complete understanding and it we don't have to add anything to it to make it bigger or more. I don't know, glamorous or anything. I mean, we don't have Listen, to. It's enough. The day that the Democratic Party, the donkey starts saying, yeah. And, and, and prophets start speaking for them and they start saying, you know, we got to turn this nation back to God. Whoever says, listen, here's how it works. Whoever falls in line with what the prophecy states, that's what I'm going to talk about. Don't ask me to talk about, well, why come you're not talking about that? And how come you're not talking about, you know, marijuana smoking? How come you're not talking? Like, come on, you guys. It, it's a very... I, it's a very childish, it's a very simplistic, it's a very, mm -hmm. like, that's not fair. You're not talking, you're only talking about my side. You're not talking about their side. Why is that your side? Right. You have a side? 
My side is the Bible. Anybody that falls in line with love your neighbor as yourself, anybody that falls in line with we ought to be keeping the commandments, including the actual Sabbath, anybody that falls in line with love your neighbor, anybody that falls in line with, with uh, <clears throat> prejudice is wrong. But, but, beloved, that's not a left thing. That's a Bible thing. And because we're so trained now to think in size, and where is that coming from? It's coming from politics. Oh, well, if you speak about this, then how come you're not speaking about that so much? Come on, you guys. My only care is about prophecy. That should be our only care. But because we've allowed the elephant in the room, now stuff like this is divisive. Really? When, 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 when y'all were talking about Pat Robertson, you know, uh, 10 years ago, 11, 15 years ago, was it divisive then? Was Pat Robinson? Right. No, 15, because y'all because y'all weren't invested. But now, for whatever reason, where many of us have become invested in something, invested in a narrative, and now it's a. You talk about that, you're 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 not a, an American lover, really. I got so much more to say, but I'm gonna be quiet now. But we have so many more weeks to talk about it. Praise God. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet. Well, that's, that's so cool. the presentation was clear and it was not. I feel like a 10 year old, if they were sitting for two hours and six minutes could in 12 seconds could <laughs> understand it. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to, to, under, to go deeper and to understand uh, deeper. This is how I felt at the beginning of Matthew 24. Like, I just feel like this was so clear. There's <clears> literally, a, like, I can't believe there's so much more yeah. to say, but there's so much more to there share. There could be 10 weeks Like, it's coming. very clear today, um, yeah. this evening, yeah. tonight, morning, wherever you are. Um, uh, and I'm going to say this. Let me just say this. The message to the Laodicean church, part of it is you're blind and you don't know it. And beloved, the gift of prophecy is given for us to see. If you're blind, if God's church is being called blind, could it be that it's because we have exchanged visions? Instead of the vision that God has given us, we are now on some other vision. We're talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the three angels' messages. There's a reason why Ellen White says that many will rise up against the straight testimony. And listen, I see it happening. I see it happening. I've seen it happening. I've seen it happening for the last three or four years. Our church, many in our church, I should say, are getting to a very dangerous place. Y'all are being influenced by false prophets and don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. you, are, you are repeating the things that false prophets are saying and don't even realize. And I got the evidence. Wait till our further presentations when you see some of these false prophets and what they are prophesying, and you'll be shocked to see that the spirit of the devil that is influencing them, you're seeing the same things coming out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. But you didn't, know, you didn't know that. You just thought, these are my own thoughts. Satan was able to plant his thoughts in the minds of angels without them even realizing he was doing it. Mm, I see. You wanna pray? Yes, but before we before pray, we pray. <laughs> just um, want to thank everyone for watching um, and to invite you um, to our online church, which is Living Mana Church. Um, and that's 11 a.m. It starts at 11 a.m. Central Time. So you have to figure out what time that is where you are. Um, but tomorrow um, for our first uh, program, um, we're going to be, um, which is Sabbath school, but we're going to be um, having Dr. Kanisha Reynolds on with us. And um, this is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And she is going to be sharing about, um, I think she told me today, one out of every eight uh, women can get breast cancer. That's what the statistics are saying. That's a very... Um, startling number, uh, but she's going to be talking about prevention and things that we can be doing to, 
to not because our bodies are the temple of God and he wants us uh, to be healthy. And so men do not tune out and be like, oh, that's a woman's program. It's not a woman's program. This is for everyone. Um, you, you know, if you have a woman in your life, if you have a wife, a daughter, a mother, a sister or not, you know, you want to hear this information. You want to be able to um, understand it because we're talking about cancer. And so even though we're specifically, you know, talking about breast cancer because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, there's a lot of good things that everyone's going to be able, men and women will be able to learn about how to um, try to do our very best to keep cancer at bay. So you're not going to want to miss tomorrow um, at 11 Central Time. Yeah. And for those of you who have, uh, I'm going to make my slides available. So please be aware of that. And um, yeah, if you want to contact me at Ivor Myers on Instagram or my Facebook page, um, you can connect, connect with me there. And uh, yes, Sam, you're correct. Some men do get, there are, I'm sorry, yeah, I interrupted yeah, you, right. but some men get breast cancer too. And I, I was just told that today as well. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a lot. You don't want to miss it. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. That's it. I'm okay. done. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I will send the slides. I'll put them up. These slides will go up under, under this presentation. There's some slides that I had to skip in this presentation towards the end. We'll hit those in the next presentation. Um, and it'll just kind of help with our recap. But uh, we'll look at that Ellen White quote, by the way, from the great controversy about the political party and uh, some other things, and then we'll move on. All right. Uh, Thank you. Yes. For watching. And we will, and there'll be the part two will be um, uh, next uh, Friday evening. So, and he, and I'm thinking, man, the recap's probably going to be an hour, but he's going to recap. <laughs> we'll do yeah. a recap. And like somebody said, can you recap next week and break it all down? So he'll do that. Yeah. It'll yes. be, it'll be a fast recap. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let's bow our heads for yeah. prayer. Definitely, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just, Lord, we thank you for this study um, that brought so much clarity and understanding. Lord, we don't want to be chasing Satan's rabbits. We don't want to be adding to the prophecies that you have given in the Bible that are so clear. Lord, we just want to be preaching the three angels message and, and, and teaching and, and helping others to understand that message and the prophecies that are found in Daniel and Revelation. They're so important um, for the end times, Lord, but we don't, again, want to add things to it that are that are unnecessary and really just Satan's um, just, he puts it there to just cause us to be, to be confused or to just not have the proper understanding of what real prophecy is teaching. So Lord, we just ask that you would, everyone that is, is her, seen this presentation or that will see the presentation, Lord, that it will encourage all of us to just want to study deeper um, and understand better so that we can share um, and not get um, sidetracked by these things that Satan wants us to be sidetracked by. We ask all of these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Have a good night, y'all. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. And, and, and watch this 10 more times if you need to. Yes. All right. And see hopefully all of you tomorrow. But all right. All right. All right. Amen. Good, good night. Good night. night.